I'm Russ Kickle. On this episode of American Reef, it's going to be part one of a two-part series where we talk about what you do when you have coral die-off. And since most of that coral die-off comes from pests, how do you make sure, right, to keep your tank pest-free? So to me, if we're going to talk about coral die-off and uh, keeping your reef tank pest-free, right, we want to talk to somebody who's a professional, right? To me, definition of professional is somebody who there are financial consequences if they are doing it wrong. So to me, that's like fish stores, farms, you know, that kind of thing. And um, like, you know, unfortunately in the United States, a lot of people don't have that formula figured out. Meaning, you know, usually they open up a store, farm, etc. Five years later, they're out of it because of whatever reasons, right? And it kind of goes back to some of the, you know, the mottos that I've always said where, again, only time really proves, we'll say, experience, um, claims, that kind of stuff to be accurate or true um, because if not what happens is uh, if not they die off and kind of only the good ones survive and we are fortunate enough where in the United States uh, even though there's not a, a lot of them we do have a few of them right and one of them is Top Shelf Aquatics down in Orlando Florida again to me they are top shelf meaning they are probably top I'll say one slash five of the stores that I've ever visited in the United States um, so with that being said, Kevin, the owner, was nice enough to basically introduce us to their aquaculture specialists and to kind of review what things that they've done to basically keep their farm pest free and to make sure that like when their customers buy a coral or a fish, etc., right, that it is the strongest, healthiest kind of fish on the planet. Um, as well as, again, pest-free because, again, they don't want to wipe out anything in the customer's tanks as well as their own. So, again, they kind of go above and beyond to make sure that happens. And in this video, basically, that's what we are going to see. Um, as far as videos, I keep your eyes open for one that I actually am doing with Mike Paletta. I got him hooked on the HPD. Long story made short, he had a Moorish idol that, you know, wasn't eaten or, or whatever. He started using it. And uh, long, again, long story made short, now he's just like flooding his tanks with the HPD. And it's funny because through all these years of, you know, again, filming with Mike, etc., never wanted to kind of, uh, again, show that. But again, in this particular case... The, the angle to that is more hard to keep fish, right? Like I said, similar like your Moorish idols, etc. And uh, so anyway, keep your eyes open for that. As far as videos go, again, you know that I'm a big fan of Bulk Resupply and Premium Aquatics. Not only because, again, they have all these great products and prices, but because they give back. Right, and how they give back um, is in many forms, but one of the forms is through these videos. And so, uh, this week, for example, on Ball Grief Supply, they have a video that talks about uh, the salt water changes, or I should say, water changes in general, and can you be successful in this hobby um, doing them or not doing them? And like everything in this hobby, the answer is yes to both, but what they do is they spend the time to actually put the parameters around it and do their tests to tell you how you can be successful going this route and how you can be successful going that route. Again, I think that's priceless and uh, my hat's off to Ryan and the team over there. I think, again, they do an excellent mm -hmm. job. Um, in that same vein, <laughs> if you're doing water changes, you need to measure the water for salinity and with uh, Premium Aquatics, they do these product videos. Well, this week's product video is on the HANA Salinity Checker. Um, and again, if you can't physically feel it, see it, touch it, you can go out check that video out where you virtually feel it, see it, touch it. It'll give you an idea of what that unit is like. And again, to me, I, I can only have good things to say about Premium Aquatics and Bulk Reef Supply. So if you want to check out some of their videos, just check out their YouTube channels. And again, if you want to thank um, Top Shelf Aquatics, uh, just, you know, if you're in the Orlando area, stop down, ask for Kevin. 
you know, tell them thank you for uh, spending time with us on these videos. Um, or you can always support them by going out to their website or Facebook and you can see what kind of corals they have for sale as well. And again, support them by purchasing whatever you need, like, desire, etc. That said, let's uh, hear what they have to say. Hey guys, Russ here. Hey, just a heads up, going forward through this video, you're going to have to adjust the audio up. Uh, basically, I had three audio tracks of which two got corrupt for some reason, so the only audio that was actually good was the one on the main camera. Um, again, it's still good. Problem is, you just got to adjust it up a little higher to hear what um, Remy, Austin, and Kevin are talking about. So that being said, again, hope you enjoy the video. So what are we doing, sir? Well, I just wanted to bring you all over here to kind of see where a lot of this stuff happens here at the store and introduce you to a couple of my aquaculture specialists. We've got Remy and Austin over Say here, I. key part of the crew. You know, they wanted to demonstrate a few things that we do different as far as the quarantine process and dipping and preparing the corals. Keep everything tip top and pest free. Good deal. Well, okay, who's, here? who's Remy, who's Austin? I am Remy Lundy, I'm one of the aquaculture specialists here at Top Shelf Aquatics. And I'm Austin Yunus, and I'm also one of the aquaculture specialists. Good deal. So what are we going to do today, gentlemen? Well, um, basically what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple pieces um, that we're going to use as examples of kind of what we do on a daily basis here. Mm -hmm. Especially when we get new pieces into the store from the wholesalers and whatnot. But a lot of these processes that we use on those kind of pieces would be kind of similar to what a hobbyist would do when they're buying something from the store as well. We'll okay. make sure to kind of show you what to look for and uh, signs to make sure that you're going through any quarantine or dipping processes properly, safely, and ensuring that your tank stays pest free. So you're saying if I'm a new hobbyist, I care about pests? Absolutely. Tell me why that is. Well, <laughs> once you start down the reef road and start throwing all these corals in your systems, mm -hmm. one bad coral can wipe out everything else that you've been working for and growing the entire time. And when you say wipe out, you mean like kill? Absolutely. Yes. These pests will eat away and kill off corals that you've worked so hard to grow. So it's very important to make sure that you're inspecting and properly quarantining or introducing the corals into your system. Got it, so you're saying here you have to worry about the same thing since you're a store. Yes, All right. absolutely, but on a much larger scale. Got it, got it. So hold it, hold it. You mean so everything that you guys do, right, basically you have to do it on a grander scale. Yes. Right? And then, okay, well, so if you do it here, why, do, why does somebody have to worry about doing it at home? Well, I think a large part of it is there's kind of a philosophy within the hobby that, you know, just because you dip something once doesn't mean it's completely cured. Dips don't kill eggs, is generally what most people talk about. So you have to break the life cycle at some point. Mm -hmm. Now, we dip most things, you know, in the store on a weekly basis almost, but we also get things in on a weekly basis as well. Sure. So it's always important that, you know, you can you know create that second line of redundancy as a hobbyist as soon as you put something into your system. Yes, we may have dipped it here, but there's also the chance that by the time it gets to your tank, you could have something go on with it again. That could have just hopped over from something new. Yeah. There's always a chance too that if you bought a piece from you know, another vendor or you know, say a friend had a frag and gave you a piece and you don't dip it and there was an egg on there, now all of a sudden your system's infected. Got it. And that could have been avoided by a simple inspection and dip before putting it into the system. Got it. Now obviously it works a little different here in the farm because there's a whole quarantine process and everything we do for every single core that goes in this room. Um, but in your store, you know, there's a lot of common pieces that the hobby relies on It's getting its miracles, which are wild play. Sure. Not something we necessarily farm in captivity in the same sure. sense. So that's more of those pieces that as a hobbyist are gonna need to be more careful. Sure, sure. You know, interesting story, a gentleman told me last week actually, 
that somebody gave him a fish. And inside that fish, right, the poo, right, who <laughs> actually contained something that, again, spread all throughout his fish. It was basically a piece of wanted, unwanted um, algae that started again as Algies a little can definitely uh, yeah. they have a way of making their way I've wherever they want <laughs> <All right. laughs> plenty of angelfish with undigested yep. seeds yep exactly but so. again that's why quarantine systems are, are so important and uh, you know just being really really thorough as far as making sure that anything uh, any alien contaminants or anything that you're foreign contaminants uh, are not being introduced into the system I mean our personal recommendation is if can, you should always have a quarantine system for Absolutely. fish and corals. Sure. Um, you know, not necessarily everyone can, so there's obviously procedures like this we do, but a lot of these are going to be the most effective when it's implemented in a quarantine system so we can, you know, use that redundancy, break those life cycles of the best. And now, does the farm have a quarantine system here? Yes. Where is it at? Okay, so it's it goes through quite a few tanks in this system. Did you want me to walk around? Yeah, okay. sure. Well, Pretty much, generally speaking, when we get any piece into the store, you know, we're going to put it over there first for observation if we can. So we just try to eliminate, if there's any, you know, potential risky signs, we're going to try to eliminate from that. And when you say over there, you mean over there? Over in the main store. Oh, over there. When we get yeah. new pieces in. Yeah. Um, once they make that, then we're going to put them into, you know, we have two main holding systems depending on the type of coral. Um, most of it is going to go in here where you see a lot of the SPS and whatnot. Um, sometimes we'll put some zones and stuff in here as well. So this is all the potential candidates yep. start here. You know, once they've made their cut from going into the storage, they go in here. We're going to assess them and try to get you know, the bulk of whatever they've got going on eliminated as much as possible. That's generally our philosophy. If we can eliminate it before the next stage, do it. Yep. Um, and once it's through here, you know, each of these systems takes about at least four to six weeks for it to go through. Um, and that's going to be weekly dipping, checking bases. Visual observation. Yes. Yeah. Making sure that they're staying healthy too. We're not going to push it through another part of the quarantine if it's not sufficient to go. So if there's Certain a lot species definitely react differently yeah. to the quarantine process. There mm -hmm. are some that are, you know, a little bit more sensitive that we have to take a little bit of extra care with. There are some that are incredibly hardy and, uh, you know, usually speaking, most of them go through the dip procedure pretty well here. Um, the one thing you have to keep in mind too is if we have several pieces that just aren't ready yet, we can't move the whole batch over. Yeah, it's kind of sure. got to go all in one shot. Because if we keep something in the previous quarantine and it might be harboring something, then everything that's staying with it or new introductories are going to get mixed with it as well. Sure. So the key is just keeping everything contained yes. and separated batch by batch. Yeah. Sure. So we're going to try to do as much as we can in this holding system first. Once we get through there, then it's the legitimate quarantines. A lot of the same stuff, but you know these are smaller, isolated systems where we're going to be doing a lot of the same things, like dipping, you know, rebasting as we transfer them through systems, inspecting, make sure they stay healthy. And okay. And those are things that we're definitely uh, we can touch up on, and show you guys what we mean when we say rebasing, and you know uh, the whole procedure of sealing over any non-living tissue. Rebasing is the term that we uh, we've coined here. And that's basically the uh, process that we use to ensure that the only thing going into a new system is living tissue. Because where uh, pests will be commonly found, especially eggs, is on non-living tissue, skeleton or rock. Okay. So basically at that point we just kind of eliminate that whole variable and that speeds up the you know, killing of the, of the, of the pest itself. It's very common for certain species of pests to actually clear an area of living tissue as well to lay their eggs. Or kind of like a damselfish would spawn on it. Sure, coral. sure. Um, but they generally do it at that base area as well. So generally if we can get only the living tissue or we cut a small section of that lowest level off as well, we can kind of ensure all of that's removed in the process. Okay. And that way not only are we killing the active pests during the dips, but after the dips, they're, we're ensuring that they don't come back. Okay. And that's the biggest key. Okay, so is that like the first step that you guys follow, or what's the very first step that you guys well, follow? Well, I think the first step, you know, visual inspection. Visual yeah. inspection, yeah. 
So obviously different pests have different signs to them, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of common stress signs you can see in the coral. So some of them might just be discoloration, or you know, you get a, you see a zoa in the store or something, and some of the polyps are slightly closed, or Maybe it's been separated your, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, or it's been in your tank for a couple of days and it just doesn't look too happy. An SPS might have you know lack of polyp extension mm -hmm. and whatnot. Thin so, tissue. Yeah. So from there, you know, we would probably physically take the piece out and look at it with a light. Uh, we use some different types of lens and stuff and a little bit of magnification and kind of look over the piece on a closer level to really see what's going on. Because a lot of those pests, you know, generally you're not just going to see it out in the open. Okay. Uh, some types of nudibranchs are big enough on certain things, but a lot of them are pretty tiny. So that's when we go in with these guys and we're going to look at the bases and whatnot and try to see if we can identify those pests. Or maybe they're eggs or bite marks. For Identification is very important too because certain pests react differently to certain dips, which is why you'll see we have sort of an assortment of dips here. Okay. Uh, you know, certain bacterial infections tend to, you know, we use uh, like an iodine based dip or coral RX. Uh, certain flatworms don't necessarily get killed by the bear, so we have a multiple stage where they'll go through a couple different of these. Uh, and you know, constantly basting them off and making sure that they're not just lingering on mm -hmm. the actual pole itself. There's not necessarily one cure for all. Exactly. exactly. Everybody's going to advertise that, and some do a pretty good job, but I think everything has strengths and weaknesses to it. So you have to build up kind of a regimen collection of things to use that you can utilize. And to some dips are more stressful on the corals themselves. Sure. So there, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of SPS, you know, we we'll use the Bayer dip for SPS, but it's a very, you know, it's a timed process. It's a very uh, exact process as far as measurements go. Uh, you know, again, we do this on a larger scale, but on a home setting, mm -hmm. it's usually you know about 10 milliliters to four ounces of tank water mm -hmm. uh, in a separate container, obviously. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's the thing. Obviously, different corals have different tendencies, so. We generally encourage the customers to ask and get a really good idea of what they're getting into with each different type of coral. Because a lot of corals can, you know, maybe withstand Bayer, for example. Mm -hmm. But yes, you can freshwater dip Zoas if you need to, but if you freshwater dip an acro, it's probably not going to make it, mm -hmm. or it's going to take it a long time to really recover. Or something mm -hmm. like that. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So we try to educate the customers. Well. Uh, again, I guess that's one of the things that separates Top Shop from everybody else. Absolutely. We, we arm can't. people with knowledge to make sure that, uh, you know, when you do encounter these things, you, you know and are prepared how to deal with it because it can be very discouraging. Right. You know, you have a tank full of all these corals and then one thing wipes them out. It's not really going <laughs> yeah, to Yeah, that's a bad thing, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's if people thing. are aware of that and, uh, you know, can actually combat that, right. it makes it, you know, so much, so much more uh, peace of mind. You know. Yeah, exactly. So I guess to that point, if you're at your local fish store or if you're a top shop and you got a coral, ask them how to dip. Yep, yeah. absolutely. And again, depending on the coral, <laughs> what Depends to dip, dip in. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what kind of examples do you got? What are we going to do? Well, what are we going to start with first? Maybe? Why don't we show them how to seal up a coral that has a receded tissue on it. All right. All right. So what we have here is a red brick cyphastria. And as you can see, these red spots are the living tissue. However, this particular <coughs> side has started to recede the tissue line. And you can see the old skeleton here has no living tissue, but there's a small thin line of what's still alive. Now to keep that from receding, we're gonna do what's called sealing the base. And that's basically, we're gonna cut away some of this receding tissue, and we're gonna seal over it with just some basic coral bait. Okay, now before you do that, why is that a bad thing? In other words, I'm a new hobbyist. Why do I care about receding tissue? Well, generally, since corals are colonizing animals, if you have a problem beginning somewhere on the body of the organism, it's very likely that it can spread. So when something's receding, you know, that could potentially go over the whole piece, depending on the type of stressor that's causing it. Um, you know, something like this, the cyphastria looks like it was potentially, you know, placed on sand, so a lot of the tissue just died off in that area sure. that was living, so it just got shaded on that. So, it may not be as big of an issue, but let's say this piece was next to a torch or some sort of euphilia that was just constantly stinging in an area. 
that could have, you know, caused some sort of infection or something to react with the piece. And this piece within a couple of days could potentially very easily just turn all white. And there you go. So again, for out. the new hobbyist, bad thing. The whole colony yeah. could be lost. Yeah. White is not growing. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, I'm a big proponent personally of give everyone a little bit of space just sure. because obviously they're going to grow but everyone needs to be able to have some boundaries from chemical interaction. Sure. So, so one of the first things we're going to do, since we notice that there's, you know, it looks relatively sealed on this piece and a lot of the parts you can see there's a clear definition of where the piece is healed over, we always like to go over and scrape some of that borderline area to kind of minimize so it's only clean tissue we're going to be sealing on this. So I would go in with the scalpel and literally, as disturbing as it seems, to just chop away at this piece. This is actually probably the better thing to do. And obviously less, be careful with this. Yes. Better. Remember in Boy Scouts your blood circle and all. So, and some pieces it's going to be a little bit more difficult to do it on just because of their textures and whatnot but it can make a pretty big difference, we found. So simply just, and it doesn't even have to be that much. I'm going through just a couple millimeters yeah. of yeah. tissue here. Yeah, you don't want to scrape too far down there because yeah. that'll have the same adverse effect of stressing yes. out your coral. Yeah, you have to remember everything you add in the dip process is another variable, and if a piece is already stressed, you're just adding more stress variables on top of it. So, you go too crazy with it you might just cause the piece to die just from that so that's why we only do a little bit of the edges now obviously this is a pretty large frag most people are going to be starting with small pieces but now if i'm a new hobbyist do i got to care about coral staying out of the water for any period of time oh uh, Again, like it's extended periods of time. Yeah. Yes, it also does depend on, largely species. on the species. Yeah. Yeah. Like zoas, softies, for example, they can be out of water for quite a while. I mean, you can sometimes several hours. But and keep in mind, maricultures too. I mean, in the wild, where these things are being grown, you know, there are points where they are out of water, exposed to the sun for an hour, or two hours. Right. Yeah, yeah cool just because sun. of tides. Right. Low tide, high tide. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, they're a lot more resilient than people think. Granted. We don't recommend leaving your corals out of the water for extended periods of yeah. time, but they are very resilient creatures. Yeah. All right, so we got a pretty good amount of this layer. This all looks like it's pretty much sealed from what we can tell. It's already healed tissue. It looks like it was growing onto the back of the frag rack again. Um, so what we do after this, obviously you kind of have all this tissue on there, so it's pretty important that you go in and actually rinse it off to some degree on that. You can see all these little particulates falling off. Yep. That's the skin that we were just scraping away that we don't want to seal in with and the glue. Some corals are going to also slime up too. So if we can kind of shake off a majority of that, obviously if it's like a slime or acro, you're just going to have a lot of that. Uh, if we can try to minimize the amount of slime we're going to be containing when we seal it, that's going to make a huge uh, difference as well. Just because that's all going to be right on the you know, exposed tissue once we seal it up, it's just gonna be laying there and eventually kind of break down on it. So I'm kind of just dabbing it down just so we can get a little bit better s stick with the glue right now. Um, kind of just depends on the piece. Coral okay. slime and glue don't go, uh, <laughs> don't go well together. Lay down, down. So at this point, I usually recommend wearing gloves, but we are a little seasoned here, so we should be okay. Um, I'm gonna go with glue, and the important thing with this is to not go out of control with it. We're just making a thin glaze over it to kind of ensure that everything's gonna stay sealed. You don't wanna just glob the glue on there. I mean, it is, again, a potential stressor if used in excess. Yeah. And what kind of glue was that? This is the uh, Coral Affix, or Coral, Coral Fix Pro. Pro. Yes. So two little fishies, yeah. Yeah. Enjoy. So generally on the larger pieces in the store, this is what we're using because it's more cost effective. Um, but we will use the BSI glue as well. So like in this instance, if we are simply trying to help the tissue heal, we could potentially just do this perimeter and be okay. But say this is a piece that we're trying to potentially avoid having eggs on or whatnot, we need to go and seal this entire area. Because this is the spot that you'll find eggs on. It's these 
patches of skeleton that don't have any tissue, mm -hmm. that's where your pests are going to be laying the eggs. Oh, really? So that's where you really want to check and make sure that there's nothing out of the ordinary, no strange spots, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, a lot of the times on the tissue of the coral itself, you'll see little white spots, you know, bite marks of different kinds of pests, uh, and that's a great indicator that maybe you should check to see if there's something there. If there is, seal it up, dip it, and be done with it. Ah, oh, got it. Yeah. A lot of people are probably going to be like, well, there's no flatworms that go in cyphashias. Well, there probably is somewhere else. Somewhere. There. Uh, <laughs> you can never be too careful. Yeah, nudibranch alone, generally, if a species exists, there's a nudibranch that feeds on it as well. Um, so you should always be cautious. I mean, over the years, Working in a retail environment with wholesalers, we, we have seen a lot of strange pests. Yes. Sure are bad, huh? So and pretty much everyone has some sort of thing that can get on them. So even we found certain things that they can be relatively easy to fix, like uh, gonopores. We do find certain types of worms that will burrow into the skin and simply sticking them in some RX, coral RX, and actually basting those tunnels that they're basting in. Basting is the biggest. Will yeah. actually cause them to come out. You know, oh, and then that's you can it. seal that area up. But if you don't, the ganis will slowly diminish as the worms feed off their tissue from sure. the inside out. And it's yeah. one of those things too that in a lot of hobbyists, especially initially, you'll hear, oh, well, don't do this type of coral, it's difficult. Or, right. you know, these are finicky. A lot of the times, you know, a simple, a simple dip like that will eliminate that and all of a sudden this hard to keep species is now a lot easier right. because there's nothing feeding on it. Right. It is a right. common thing with certain mushrooms too, like Yuma's. Mm. I found certain worms that look almost like uh, thinner versions of maybe bobbit worms or bristle worms that actually will feed on the foot from the underside in the rock. Sure. And you're just not realizing, unless you peel open the rock underneath where you're potentially ripping the foot, you'll see them actually moving around in there. Sure. So everything can definitely have something to it. <laughs> so and remember too, you know, if you do see a piece that's stressed out in your tank, and uh, you know, you notice anything a little unusual or out of the ordinary, always test your water first. Water parameters is the first thing you should be checking. If that is all well and clear, it's at that point that you'll start doing things like this and really looking for pests. Got it. Okay, so now we're at the point that the glue is over the area that we're trying to seal, which is all non-living tissue. So. We could just stick this in the tank and let the glue cure on its own, but that generally takes a little while. So we like to use some of the Boston Aqua Farms uh, Coral Accelerator, mm -hmm. and we just simply apply a couple drops to that area. And what it does is it literally just accelerates the curing time of the piece, um, pretty much to the point where I could probably be touching this in a map in a minute or so, um, and then that way it's sealed for good. Sure. You don't have to worry about it. As you can see, the piece is starting to slime up a little bit. It's on the living tissue area, but we already kind of dabbed off the non-living so we should be good with that as well. So I'm gonna stick this piece in, give it a second to heal here. It's always good to shake it while it's carrying too because it can perform or produce some bubbles on it as well. The bubbles are definitely a stressor to tissue. So basting it off after this process, any sort of coral baster, even a small pipette, give it a little squeeze, kind of get some of that stuff off of there. Usually we come back you know, later in the day, uh, especially if it's like a new frag and a new frag plug. Um, some people soak plugs beforehand, um, but if that's not the case, you're going to get some bubbles just from the pores of the plug starting to absorb a lot of water. Sure. Start. That air can stress the pieces out, so it's good to go over and baste them, you know, next day at least. Yeah, that makes absolutely. sense. Okay, so we got that piece. Uh, let's see, what was the other piece we were doing? I think we were going to show them.